He is a father, a native of Uvalde, Texas, and a gun owner. And a gun owner. He, he is here today to use his platform to call on leaders to take bipartisan action to end the senseless killing and pass reasonable gun responsibility measures that we know will save lives. Just a few minutes ago, Matthew met briefly with the president to talk about the importance of, t of taking action, keeping our communities safe. But without further ado, I will like to bring up Matthew. Thank you. Here we go. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Camilla. <sighs> to make the loss of these lives matter. My, uh, my wife and I, uh, my wife and I, Camilla, we spent most of last week on the ground with the families in Uvalde, Texas. We shared stories tears and memories. The, uh, the common thread, independent of the anger and the confusion and the sadness, it, it was the same. How can these families continue to honor these deaths by keeping the dreams of these children and teachers alive? Again, how can the loss of these lives matter? So while we honor and acknowledge the victims, we, we need to recognize that this time it seems that something is different. There is a sense that perhaps there's a viable path forward. Responsible parties in this debate seem to at least be committed to sitting down and having a real conversation about a new and improved path forward. A path that can bring us closer together and make us safer as a country. A path that can actually get something done this time. Uh, Camille and I came here to share my stories from my hometown of Uvalde. Came here to take meetings with elected officials on both sides of the aisle. We came here to speak to them, to speak with them, and to urge them to speak with each other. To remind and inspire them that the American people will continue to drive forward the mission of keeping our children safe. Because it's more than our right to do so. It's our responsibility to do so. I'm here today in the hopes of applying what energy, reason, and passion that I have into trying to turn this moment into a reality. Because as I said, this moment is different. We are in a window of opportunity right now that we have not been in before. A window where it seems like real change. Real change can happen. Uvalde, Texas is where I was born. I swear my my mom taught kindergarten less than a mile from Robb Elementary. New Valley is where I learned to master a, a, a Daisy BB gun. Took, that took two years before I graduated to a 410 shotgun. New Valley is where I was taught to revere the power and the capability of the tool that we call a gun. New Valley is where I learned responsible gun ownership. Now, Uvalde called me on May 24th when I learned the news of this devastating tragedy. I had been out of cellular range working in the studio all day when I emerged, and messages about a mass shooting in the town I was born in began flooding my inbox. In a bit of shock, I drove home, hugged my children a bit tighter and longer than the night before, and then the reality of what had happened that day in the town I was born in set in. So the next morning, Camilla, myself, and the kids, we loaded up the truck and we drove to Uvalde. And when we arrived a few hours later, I gotta tell you, even from the inside of our vehicle, you, you, could, you could feel the shock in the town. You, you could feel the pain, the denial, the disillusion, anger, blame, sadness, loss of lives, dreams halted. We saw ministries, we saw first responders, counselors, cooks, families trying to grieve without it being on the front page news. We met with the local funeral director and countless morticians who, who hadn't slept since the massacre the day before because they've been working 24-7 trying to handle so many bodies at once. So many little innocent bodies who had their entire lives still yet to live. And that is there that we met two of the grieving parents, Ryan and Jessica Ramirez. 
their 10-year-old daughter, Alethea. She was one of the 19 children that were killed the day before. Now, Alethea, her dream was to go to art school in Paris and one day share her art with the world. Ryan and Jessica were eager to share Alethea's art with us and said if we could share it, that somehow, maybe that would make Alethea smile in heaven. They told us that showing someone else Alethea's art would in some way keep her alive. Now this particular drawing is a, uh, is a self-portrait all right, of, of Alethea drawing with her friend in heaven looking down on her drawing the very same picture. Her mother said uh, of this drawing, she, she said, you know, we never really talked to her about heaven before, but somehow she knew. Letha was 10 years old. Her father, Ryan, this man was steady. He was uncommonly together and calm. When a, a frazzled friend of his came up and said, how are you so calm? I, I'd, be, I'd be going crazy. Ryan told him, he said, no, you wouldn't. No, you wouldn't. You'd be strong for your wife and kids because if they see you go crazy, that will not help them. Just a week prior, Ryan got a full-time line job, stringing power lines from pole to pole. And every day since landing that well-paying full-time job, he reminded his daughter, Alethea, he said, girl, daddy gonna spoil you now. Told her every single night, he said, Daddy's going to take you to SeaWorld one day. But he didn't get to, see, he didn't get to spoil his daughter. Lydia, she did not get to go to SeaWorld. We also met Anna and Danilo, the mom and the stepdad of nine-year-old Maite Rodriguez. And my Maite wanted to be a marine biologist. She was already in contact with Corpus Christi University of A&M for her future college enrollment. Nine years old. Maite cared for the environment so strongly that when the city asked her mother if they could release some balloons into the sky in her memory, her mom said, oh no, Maite wouldn't want to litter. Maite wore green high top converse with a heart she had hand drawn on the right toe because they represented her love of nature. Camilla's got these shoes. Can you show these shoes, please? Wore these every day. Green Converse with a heart on the right toe. These are the same green Converse on her feet that turned out to be the only clear evidence that could identify her after the shooting. How about that? Mm -hmm. Maite wrote a letter. Her mom said if Maite's letter could help someone accomplish her dream, that then her death would have an impact. And it would mean her dying had a point and was it pointless. That it would make the loss of her life matter. The letter reads, Marine biologist, I want to pass school to get to my dream college. My dream college is in Corpus Christi by the ocean. I need to live next to the ocean because I want to be a marine biologist. Marine biologists study animals and the water. Most of the time I will be in a lab. Sometimes I will be on TV. Then there was Ellie Garcia a 10-year-old, and her parents, Stephen and Jennifer. Ellie loved to dance and she loved church. She even knew how to drive tractors and was already working with her dad and her uncle mowing yards. Ellie was always giving of her gifts, her time, even half-eaten food on her plate, they said. So around the house, we called her the great re-gifter. Smiling through tears, her family told us how Ellie loved to embrace, said she was the biggest hugger in the family. Now, Ellie was born Catholic, but had been going to Baptist church with her uncle for the last couple of years. 
her mom and dad were proud of her because they said she was learning to love God no matter where. The week prior to her passing, she'd been preparing to read a verse from the Bible for the next Wednesday night's church service. The verse was from Deuteronomy 6.5. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy might. That's who Ellie was becoming. But she never got to read it. Service on that Wednesday night. Then there was a fairy tale love story of a teacher named Irma and her husband Joe. What a great family this was. This was an amazing family. Camille and I, we, 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 we sat with about 20 of their family members in their living room, along with their four kids. Uh, they were Kids were 23, 19, 15, and 13. They, they, they shared all these stories about Irma and Joe served the community and would host all these parties and how Irma and Joe were planning on getting a food truck together when they soon retired. They were humble, hard-working people. Irma was a teacher who her family said went above and beyond and just couldn't say no to any kind of teaching. Joe had been commuting to and from work 70 miles away in Del Rio for years. Together they were the glue of the family. Both worked overtime to support their four kids. Irma even worked every summer when school was out. The money she had made two summers ago paid to, paid to paint the front of the house. The money she made last summer paid to paint the sides of the house. This summer's work was going to pay to paint the back of the house. Because Irma was one of the teachers who was gunned down in the classroom. And Joe, her husband, literally died of heartache the very next day when he had a heart attack. They never got to paint the back of their house. They never got to retire. And they never got to get that food truck together. We also met a cosmetologist. Right, she was well-versed in mortuary makeup. That's the task of making the victims appear as peaceful and natural as possible for their open casket viewings. These bodies were very different. They needed much more than makeup to be presentable. They needed extensive restoration. Why? Due to the exceptionally large exit wounds of an AR-15 rifle. Most of the body so mutilated that only DNA test or green converse could identify them. Many children were left not only dead, but hollow. So yes, counselors are going to be needed in Uvalde for a long time. Counselors are needed in all these places where these mass shooters have been for a long time. I, I was told by many that it takes a good year before people even understand what to do next. And even then, when they come sure, secure enough to take the first step forward, a lifetime is not going to heal those wounds. But again, you, you know what every one of these parents wanted, what they asked us for? What every parent separately expressed in their own way to Camilla and me? That they want their children's dreams to live on. That they want their children's dreams to continue to accomplish something after they are gone. They want to make their loss of life matter. Look, we heard from, we heard from so many people, right? Families of the deceased, mothers, fathers, sisters, brothers, Texas Rangers, hunters, Border Patrol, and responsible gun owners who won't give up their Second Amendment right to bear arms. And you know what they all said? 
We want secure and safe schools, and we want gun laws that won't make it so easy for the bad guys to get these damn guns. So, we know it's on the table. We need to invest in mental health care. We need safer schools. We need to restrain sensationalized media coverage. We need to restore our family values. We need to restore our American values. And we need responsible gun ownership. Responsible gun ownership. We need background checks. We need to raise the minimum age to purchase an AR-15 rifle to 21. We need a waiting period for those rifles. We need red flag laws and consequences for those who abuse them. These are reasonable, practical, tactical regulations to our nation, states, communities, schools, and homes. Responsible gun owners are fed up with the Second Amendment being abused and hijacked by some deranged individuals. These regulations are not a step back. They're a step forward for a civil society and, and the Second Amendment. Look, is this cure-all? Hell no. But people are hurting. Families are, parents are. And look, as is, is, is divided as our country is, this gun responsibility issue is one that we agree on more than we don't. It really is. Look, this should be a, a nonpartisan issue. This should not be a partisan issue. There is not a Democratic or Republican value in one single act of these shooters. It's not. But people in power have failed to act. So we're asking you, and I'm asking you, will you please ask yourselves, can both sides rise above? Can both sides see beyond the political problem at hand and admit that we have a life preservation problem on our hands? So we've got a chance right now to reach for and to grasp a higher ground above our political affiliations. A chance to make a choice that does more than protect your party. A chance to make a choice that protects our country now and for the next generation. We've got to take a sober, humble, and honest look in the mirror and rebrand ourselves based on what we truly value. What we truly value. We've got to get some real courage and honor our immortal obligations instead of our party affiliations. Enough with the counterpunching. Enough of the invalidation of the other side. Let's come to the common table that represents the American people. Find a middle, middle ground, the place where most of us Americans live anyway, especially on this issue. Because I promise you, uh, America, you and me, who, we are not as divided as we are being told we are. No. How about we get inspired, give ourselves just cause to revere our future again? Maybe set an example for our children, give us reason to tell them, hey, listen and, and watch these, these, these men and women. These are great American leaders right here. Hope you grow up to be like them. And let's admit it, we can't truly be leaders if we're only living for re-election. Let's be knowledgeable and wise and act on what we truly believe. Again, we've got to look in the mirror, lead with humility, and acknowledge the values that are inherent to, but also above, politics. We've got to make choices, make stands, embrace new ideas, and preserve the traditions that can create true, true progress for the next generation. With real leadership, let's start giving us all of us with real leadership, let's start giving all of us good reason to believe that the American dream is not an illusion. So where do we start? We start by making the right choices on the issue that is in front of us today. 
We start by making laws that save innocent lives and don't infringe on our Second Amendment rights. We start right now by voting to pass policies that can keep us from having as many Columbines, Sandy Hooks, Parklands, Las Vegas, Buffaloes, and Uvaldes from here on. We start by giving Alethea a chance to be spoiled by her dad. We start by giving Mate a chance to become a marine biologist. We start by giving Ellie a chance to read her Bible verse at the Wednesday night service. We start by giving Irma and Joe a chance to finish painting their house. Maybe retire, get that food truck. We start by giving McKenna, Layla, Miranda, Nevea, Jose, Javier, Tess, Rogelio, Eliana, Annabelle, Jackie, Azuya, JC, Jayla, Ava, Amory, and Lexi. We start by giving all of them our promise that their dreams are not going to be forgotten. We start by making the loss of these lives matter. Thank you. Are the changes that are being discussed enough for you, Mr. McConaughey? What was your message to the president? I know that the president has an event uh, right after this. I think it's running, it's running a few minutes, a few minutes behind. So um, I will, we'll do the briefing until we have to, we have to move to, uh, to the event. Have a couple of things at the top, and then we'll open it up. Uh, as I just mentioned, uh, soon the president will sign into law nine bipartisan bills that support veterans, and he will be joined by members of Congress from both parties, veteran advocates, and veterans who will benefit from these laws. President Biden ran on the promise to unite the country, which is why supporting veterans is a key part of his unity agenda announced at the State of the Union. Supporting our country's veterans is an issue that all Americans can agree on. Among the impact of the bills being signed into law today are two that will improve access to breast imaging services for veterans, including those who experience toxic, toxic exposures during military service. Other bills to be signed include three to honor the legacy of service to our nation, including one to award a single Congressional Gold Medal to the U.S. Army Rangers World War II. The Rangers played a crucial role in the D-Day invasion of Normandy, which began exactly 78 years ago yesterday. Also today, the Senate voted to, to advance the PACT Act. The President was clear in his state of the Union that addressing toxic exposures is a priority and Congress should move with the urgency for our veterans. Today, Congress took a major step forward. President Biden looks forward to final passage of this legislation so that he can sign it into law and continue to uphold our sacred obligation to support those who have served our nation, their families, caregivers, and survivors. Today, the administration announced new investments from the American Rescue Plan to help provide every American with access to affordable, high-speed internet. These investments will bring down costs for families and small businesses, particularly in rural and remote areas, and ensure affordability. This morning, Treasury announced the first state awards from the $10 billion Capital Projects Fund, which will make resources immediately available in Louisiana, New Hampshire, Virginia, and West Virginia to connect over 200,000 homes that currently lack access. 
On a, on a sad note, um, our dear friend and colleague, Michael Gwynn, will be leaving us for Treasury, where he will, be ser well, he will serve as Deputy Assistant Secretary for Public Affairs. Gwen has served as the White House Di Director of Rapid Response for the past 60 months, responding to the most challenging and difficult issues imaginable. Yet amidst the, these often emotionally wrenching stories, Gwen's poise and moral clarity are unfailing, and his willingness and ability to step up has made him an indispensable member of the team. And joining Gwen at the Treasury Department will be our very own Michael Kikukawa, where he will serve as a spokesperson. Michael, better known here, to all of you, to all of us, as Kiku has served not just as a press assistant, but, but as the strong engine uh, and reliable engine at the press shop. His relentless work ethic and dedication to the mission of this team have been second to none. Kiku and Gwen, we will miss you both. Thank you so much. Very heart-wrenching, but I'm very excited for both of you. Wishing you the best. And we do have some hellos. I know we keep announcing people leaving, but we actually have people coming and backfilling some great, great folks uh, who are joining our team. Two new members uh, who are here uh, to our team. I'd like to first introduce Abdullah Hassan right here. Some of you know him already, uh, who will be joining us as an assistant press secretary, having previously served as the deputy associate director for communications for the White House Office of Management and Budget. Amongst many topics, Abdullah will be covering civil rights, immigration, and climate. We also would like to extend a warm welcome to Alexandra Lamana. Hello who is joining us on detail from Treasury, where she has served as senior spokesperson. Part of Alexandra's uh, portfolio will be working on housing, infrastructure implementation, and other economic issues. Abdullah and Alexandra haven't even gotten their, f their full time badges yet, uh, but we are already getting them hard at, hard at work, and we appreciate all of their work thus far. It has We have felt uh, the impact of it. Okay, please join me on welcoming the team, and with that, I think that's all I have. All right, go ahead. Go ahead. Thanks, Karina. I know we're, we're, get, we're getting started here kind of uh, late, yeah. and this yeah. is the last break of the week. I'm hoping you might be able to take this off uh, after the President's event. Because we got a lot of people um, have questions. I, uh, I, I hear you. I have other, I have other uh, obligations as well after, after this. So we'll see. We'll see what we can do. But I can't make any promises. But let's, why don't we get going? Great. Uh, so uh, on, the, on the subject of guns, the President had his meeting with, uh, with Chris Murphy, but he didn't speak to the public today. You know, does the president have a clear sense of where things are, what is possible on Capitol Hill, and also why is he turning to a Hollywood actor to make the message, take the message to the American people? Does well, he feel that his voice doesn't matter? His voice does matter. You heard him speak on Thursday uh, very clearly, very loudly, uh, very passionately uh, during prime time. At a, at a critical time during the day uh, where he made sure that he can communicate with the American people. And so he's the President of the United States. His voice carries and it does matter. What he says uh, is has carries uh, weight uh, that is pretty tremendous. Um, Matthew was here because, as you heard, he has a very personal connection to Uvalde. Uh, he met with the family. He is from there. He was born there. He lives in Texas. And uh, we thought hearing from him directly, him using his platform, is incredibly important. We all know what it's like uh, or how important it is for folks, uh, especially on um, whether you are an actor, uh, whether you are in the, the business sector, wherever you are, to use your platform, how critical and important it is. And I think his words here today were incredibly powerful and emotional. And I thank him and Camila for coming here today. They met with the president, as I just mentioned. Um, and so I just you know, wanted to just address that. Zeke, uh, the president received an update, as, uh, as you all know, as we've mentioned, from Senator Murphy on the state of negotiations on Capitol Hill. He told Senator Murphy he strongly support his efforts to find a compromise and encouraged him to get the strongest possible results. In the end, the president said that the message he took from the families from at Uvalde when he was there was to do something, was to please do something. That's what uh, the grieving family told him. Some of you heard that yourselves uh, from uh, the community, uh, mem from the community when he was in Uvalde. And so that is what uh, Senator Murphy and his colleagues are going to do. They're going to do just that. Um, I'm going to move on. So, uh, so the president's meeting with uh, President Bolsonaro of Brazil. Uh, the AP is reporting that uh, the Brazilian government, President Bolsonaro, wanted specific concessions from the president 
with a, for that meeting that they, and for his attendance at the Summit of the Americas that he wouldn't bring up uh, Bolsonaro's casting doubts about Brazil's election, election system as well as uh, uh, environmental concerns in the Amazon. Can you confirm that report? I, I cannot confirm that report. The president is um, is is looking forward to leaving tomorrow uh, to head to the summit. That clearly that we're uh, that we are hosting. Um, I can say this: that the United States continues to recognize um, Juan Guaido as the interim president of Venezuela. That said, while the interim government was uh, was not invited uh, to participate in the main summit, they are welcome to participate in all three stakeholder forums and other events. Is the president now getting more directly involved in the negotiations on the Hill now that he's met with Senator Murphy? Well, I, you know, I want to be very clear here. Senator Murphy uh, has said this many times uh, during interviews on various networks here, uh, that he believes it's time for the Senate to act. Uh, and that is what they're doing. The president is encouraged uh, about what he is seeing uh, with this team of negotiators on the, on the Senate side. And uh, he is, in, in, like I said, encouraged and wants to continue uh, to see them move forward and, and take action. And in the meeting with uh, Matthew McConaughey, did, did McConaughey go through the same elements with the president that he did here at the podium? Well, they had a private conversation. I'm not going to read out their private conversation. Um, as you can imagine, the president went to Uvalde himself. He also met. Uh, met with many of the family members. Uh, he also has heard many of the stories uh, that Matthew came here to, to share with all of you. Uh, so they certainly connected um, on that aspect. Thanks, Craig. Is the president willing to accept whatever agreement lawmakers come to, should they come to an agreement when it comes to guns? So here's, as you know, the president has been very involved in gun reform as senator, as vice president, and clearly now as president, uh, having uh, signed uh, uh, the most executive actions on gun reform than any president at this time of their presidency. Uh, and when when he was senator, uh, he was he was talking about this today. It took him years. It took him years to get uh, the 1994 assault ban um, uh, assault ban uh, legislation. Uh, now that that was law for 10 years and expired in 2004 and so we haven't seen this type of uh, this type of negotiations or this type of coming together from both sides in a very long time uh, it's been decades so he is encouraged uh, he is optimistic about what about what he's seeing uh, about what he is hearing uh, the update that he received and so uh, we're going to see how those negotiations go um, and any any step we will he believes any step is a step forward he's going to continue to call uh, for all of the things that you heard him lay out when it comes to what he sees as a comprehensive gun reform on Thursday but he also believes uh, that uh, any step forward is a is, is important clearly we're not going to negotiate from here and we're going to leave the specifics to the senators and one other question does he still seek to make Saudi Arabia a pariah state well, I spoke to this. Uh, I spoke to this yesterday, uh, and I could share some more thoughts uh, on that now. But um, look, the president uh, was very clear when he was asked about this on um, on Friday uh, when he was delivering his remarks on the economy, um, and basically he said, as president, he believes that if there is any um, any way to get uh, peace. He feels like he should take that. Uh, he should take that direction. Uh, so Saudi Arabia has been a strategic partner uh, of the United States for eight decades. Every president since FDR has met with Saudi leaders, and the president considers Saudi Arabia an important partner on a host of regional and global strategies, including other efforts to end the war in Yemen, uh, uh, contain Iran, and counter terrorism. Saudi pilots flew uh, with ours in the war against ISIS. Its Navy patrols with, uh, with ours in the Red Sea and the Gulf, and the U.S. military personnel are based in Saudi Arabia. As I've said, the president will meet with any leader if it serves the interests of the American people. That's what he puts first. He believes engagement with Saudi leaders clearly meets that test, as has every president before him. I'm going to move around. I'm going to move around. I'm going to move around. I'm going to. I'm going to really. Okay, I'm going to take one more. I'm going to take. I'm. I'm. Caitlin. I'm going to take one more. I'm going to take one more. On these negotiations, if changing background checks for younger people than 21 is what ends up happening, if opening these juvenile records to more scrutiny is what comes of this, does the president believe that that is meaningful change? Is that satisfying? If that's what comes of this moment, is he okay with that? 
So the president was clear uh, last week that there's real urgency and uh, to make sure something like Uvalde or Buffalo and many mass shootings prior can't happen again. And we're encouraged again by the progress that we're seeing. You know, we're, we're going to stay closely engaged. We're going to not uh, negotiate from here. We're going to let the contours of, of the legislation uh, and those conversations play out. Uh, and what we are encouraged by is that the conversation is happening. Both sides are coming together. We saw the House taking some taking some actions last week. They're, they're, they also are take some actions uh, this week. What we, what the president believes is that we have to do something. And like he said on Thursday, enough is enough. I can't speak to the timeline. That is going to be up to uh, Senator Schumer and um, and Chris Murphy and their conversations that we're having. Can you take some on the economy? Uh, we need a longer break. Yeah, we do. Uh, uh, can you, uh, can you, uh,